Okay, so when we talk about the stressors for our gut, so what is impacting our gut? What makes it compromised? Um, of course, you know, for me, I want to dive into the food side, but, you know, we got to look at our environmental toxins, our chronic stressors that are in our life. And that's why, you know, if you work with, with Dr. Kenodi and I, we're always addressing stressors, you know, and that can be um, external, internal toxins, lots of different things to address there. Processed foods sugars, additives, pesticides. There's a lot of different things that can impact our gut lining. And the analogy that I love to use when I talk to people is think of our gut as a garden. And you may have heard this before, but it's, it's such a, a great analogy that with our gut, when it's been compromised, we get weeds. And I don't know about you, but if I'm gonna garden, which I know a lot of people are right now because everybody's getting very excited with the spring weather, I don't want my vegetable garden to have weeds in there. I want it to flourish. And I'm using a vegetable garden, of course, but it could be your beautiful flowers. And so we have to take care of that garden. We have to make sure it stays healthy by feeding it the plants the right nutrients, by watering it regularly, um, and weeding it frequently. You know, we gotta make sure that we get out the bad stuff so that it can flourish. And I think what's really empowering is that we have the opportunity to make choices each day and you know specifically around food that can help support a healthy garden. And I'm gonna mute here, pause for a second, see if Dr. Kenodia would like to interject. I don't think he can come off mute, okay. Well, then I'm going to continue. So I'm actually going to do a little screen share here for you because I, I love my visuals. And let me go back here in the chat box for a second. All right, so let's share this document. You may be familiar with something called the Environmental Working Group. Technology is great when it works, isn't it? <laughs> We're just gonna continue going. Um, let's see, it's trying to live. Let's give it a moment. So the Environmental Working Group comes out with some really amazing guides. Um, they actually have an app as well, which is really nice and uh, convenient for when you're actually in the grocery store. Here we go. We are going to share my screen. We are going to bring that up here. So here we go. The Environmental Working Group came out recently with their 2021 guide for pesticides and produce. Let's make this a little bit bigger too for you. All right, so what you'll see here, and this goes back to, you know, how do we put this into practice? So I always like to be practical when we talk about, you know, okay, pesticides. So what does that mean in my shopping? So when you take a look at this list, you'll see the EWG's Environmental Working Group's 2021 Shopper's Guide to Pesticides and Produce. And they come out each year with the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. So if you're saying, how can we make this practical? I'm on a budget. What is most important for organic produce? It's gonna be the dirty 12 or the dirty dozen. These are the foods that have the highest amount of tested pesticides in them. So it becomes really important that we purchase these ingredients organic. And then we have our clean 15. And you'll notice this is a guide that you can actually cut along the line, print it off um, and take it with you. But I like to keep it um, handy on my phone and I'm going to stop screen sharing here. There we go. All right. So, and I was just pausing seeing if what Dr. Kenodi is doing on his end. Um, all right. So that's the dirty dozen list. Uh, you can, like I said, go to the environment, Environmental Working Group's website. You can get the app uh, if you have questions on that. You can always ask at the end here. And now we're gonna go, we're gonna move away from the gut in terms of why it's so important. And we're gonna go to what do we want to put on our plate for a truly nourishing plate? Um, you know, this is a really tough question because I think that there's a time and place for a lot of different food opportunities and to really boil it down. But I think, you know, big picture, as I was talking to Dr. Kenodia about this, looking at what makes my plate nourishing? You know, what do I want to make sure each time when I have the opportunity to make that choice, what is on that plate? And one of the, I feel like I need a drum, drum roll. The first thing that I would say is plants. And this probably comes as no surprise to you. Um, there's a lot of hype and a lot of talk about plants. So specifically, what do I mean? What, what does it mean when you 
say, okay, eat more plants, great. Okay, how, what is that and how do we make that happen? What I'm referencing are, are leafy greens and also our non-starchy vegetables. So when we're talking about this category, again, why? Let's connect it. You know, why is that important? These are the foods that contain disease-fighting compounds. They have antioxidants. They have anti-inflammatory and detox benefits. I know trigger word, people love the word detox, but I'm talking how do we support the body and the system in our gut? They also contain fiber. So when we take a look at, you know, let's look at food for thought here. So I, I love kind of bringing factual things into this. And uh, it, this really stood out to me. I know Dr. Kenodia has said this to me when I first started working with the practice many years ago. And I just read it again in the Pegan Diet book by Dr. Hyman, and it caught my eye. And it says, our ancestors ate more than 800 varieties of plant foods. But today, only 15 crops make up 90% of our food intake. Wow, that, I think that that's crazy. That's a crazy fact just right there in itself. So hearing that and thinking about your grocery cart each week, are you using, are you buying the same foods over and over or do you mix it up? Do you try to aim for 800 of those different varieties? I know I struggle with it and I have to be really intentional about looking at what is one new thing this week that I want to put into my cart. And when we do that, let's take it one step further. So we're looking at varieties of our plant foods and our non-starchy vegetables. But I think what is a really good way to do that naturally is how do we eat the rainbow? And I'm not talking Skittles. I know that's probably everybody's first thought because they've done great with marketing. Um, but let's eat the rainbow of colors into our day of produce. So I'm talking reds, orange, yellow, green. Green's the most common for myself. Um, our dark purples and blues, those are the colors that we're aiming for because when we get the plethora of phytonutrients, so think plant nutrients, our phytochemicals, those are the foods providing the disease-fighting compounds. So the more that we can incorporate all of the different colors, we're going to have benefits for our cell protection, um, anti-cancer benefits, anti-inflammatories, our heart health, cognition. So the more color, the better. And I have a tip for you. So, you know, I'm, again, always about practical. When you go to the grocery store the next time, you may be thinking, I'm, I'm going to eat my broccoli and my cauliflower and my carrots and you're not telling me any different. However, I encourage you, the next time that you go to the grocery store or maybe you're doing some Instacart right now, look in the same section of where you would normally get your produce. When you look at the cauliflower, there's purple cauliflower, there's orange cauliflower. So just by getting the same vegetable in another color, you're already expanding your phytonutrient power. And I think I hear, do I hear Dr. Kenodi on here as well? No, I do not. Okay. So let's piggyback off of that. Let's keep going. So in terms of a reference, the IFM has a phytonutrient guide. Love, love, love this. I love it so much. I have it on my desktop so I can share it with whoever needs a little support and encouragement. So when, when we look at that guide, it breaks down and it shows here's our red foods, yellow foods, green foods. Here are the benefits. That is a great guide and something that our team may be able to share with you or that you can pull up on your own. But the IFM phytonutrient guide is wonderful. Um, you know, when we're talking about these specific foods and, and which, which ones pack the most punch, think your dark leafy greens, um, think colors, think eating the rainbow, and aim to get in the color of the rainbow each day. You know, try it one day. It, what's it going to hurt? If you don't like it, you don't have to do it tomorrow. But really just take a look at your plate. Aim for half of it to be with different plants and different colors. So number one was plants. Moving on to our second um, second food for a truly nourishing plate. Again, a drum roll over here. I wish I could hear you guys and see you guys. <laughs> um, Leah, I will uh, ask the marketing team what they're able to do, do on that end in terms of the guide because it is really great. So number two, fiber, 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 fiber. And 
I mentioned fiber in terms of benefits from our leafy greens and our plants, um, our non-starchy vegetables, but I really want to focus on prebiotic fiber, which doesn't get a lot of hype. We hear so much about probiotic fiber, or I'm sorry, probiotics, that I think prebiotic just isn't as, you know, isn't as fun. It's not something that people think about, um, not something that's really acknowledged. But it should be because this is what's going to help our healthy garden and our gut. This is actually the fertilizer. So prebiotic. Think, um, think feeding, you know, fertilizing. Um, this is the type of fiber that supports the growth of the healthy bacteria or probiotics. So these are different. Um, prebiotics and probiotics, and they're indigestible fibers that are actually fermented by our microflora and feed that friendly bacteria. So, so what are some prebiotic rich fibers? Um, I would say one of the top ones is dandelion greens. Again, not a whole lot of hype over dandelion greens, but that could expand your horizon in terms of different foods to try. And um, dandelion greens are great in salads, they're great to add to smoothies, um, onions as an aromatic is another prebiotic rich fiber. Flax seeds, one of my all time favorites. You're going to hear me say this again later on, but flax seeds are so incredible. They have omega 3 benefits, fiber benefits, and they're so easy to add into anything. Um, you know, I, I grind them up fresh, keep them in my fridge for a few days because the fresher the better, and sprinkle it on top of anything really my vegetables, my salads, in a smoothie, in a soup. They're so versatile and so great. Additionally, we have things like apples asparagus, avocado, um, garlic. There's just lots of prebiotic fiber. So prebiotics plus probiotics, they work together to create a balanced gut. As I said, they are different. Our probiotics are those live microorganisms, um, and, but we can add in probiotic rich foods as well. So sauerkraut, um, coconut yogurt, kimchi, those are some examples. So fiber in general, Dr. Kenodi has told me this many, many times, that fiber in general is an indicator of our longevity. Wow. If that doesn't put fiber on your radar, I, I, I just encourage you to put it on your radar. <laughs> it's so important. It's so, so, so important. So just to give you kind of a, an idea of what, what does that mean? So most people don't have an idea of, of grams of fiber that they're consuming. So sometimes we use a check-in tool. The one that I like to use with people is called chronometer. And it's not for us to track every day and, and know exactly, you know, measuring and, and getting everything in there, but it's a great snapshot tool to really check in, to be mindful of what you think you're consuming and what you actually actually are. So when we look at fiber, I will tell you that most people when they do that check-in tool, on average they're consuming 10 to 15 grams of fiber per day. 10 to 15 grams. So now keep that in mind when I say the next statement. The, the recommended daily amount of fiber is 25 grams per day for a woman and 38 grams per day for men. Because it's so incredibly important, Dr. Kenodi and I find that at least 38 grams per day for people, but even aiming for more, dependent on the other gut conditions that are happening, aiming for 50 grams a day. So go from 10 grams a day to 38 or even 50, that's a huge jump. And so it becomes really, really important for us to pay attention. So step one, add in more plants. There's fiber in those. Step two, add some seeds like flax seed. That's it. Like I said, a really easy way. We also get fiber from nuts and berries and our cruciferous vegetables. So our powerhouses, I like to call them, our broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage. So keep that in mind. You know, fiber is, is so important. So I'll get off my soapbox on fiber, but that's number two. The next one in our top three nourishing foods is, last drum roll, I promise, healthy fats. Wow, I don't know if you thought I was gonna say that, but let's talk about fat for a minute. So there was a, you know, a while back, there was a low fat fad, we'll call it. So fat, I mean, it has so much fear attached to it. And we're now moving to this side of, that is an essential part of our body functions and us understanding that. And when we're eating low fat or they're stripping away natural fat from whole foods, what do you think it's being filled back up with? Additives, sugar, sweeteners. 
um, ingredients you can't pronounce. So we want to move away from the fear of fat and look at our healthy fats. So aiming to eat a healthy fat at each meal time. And what are some examples of a healthy fat? So we're not talking trans fats. We're talking monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats. We are talking about avocados, olive oil, and pure olive oil, cold pressed. You know, it's, it hasn't been destroyed by chemicals and heat. We're talking fatty fish for the omega-3, so our wild caught uh, salmon, uh, mackerel, herring, sardines. Uh, we're talking flax and chia seeds. So these are all examples of healthy fat. Now I'm not saying high fat, that's different. We're saying incorporating a serving of healthy fat at mealtimes. So when you take a look at your plate, it may be adding avocado slices on top of your eggs or a healthy dose of, of some pure olive oil on top of your salad for your salad dressing. Um, maybe it's that flax that I keep coming back to you and, and maybe it's sprinkled on top of your food. So healthy fat is is different for everybody in term not different for healthy but it's different in terms of the amounts consumed and that goes into what we're eating on a typical day and how we can enhance what your balance looks like but the plate that i'm creating as i'm talking through this and if you've worked for with me is protein fat fiber pff uh, one of my patients said that one time and it just stuck with me i love it it's our protein fat fiber uh, template and that's what we aim for for a balanced plate when we're taking a look at it so our fiber is all of those fabulous plants, our healthy fats, which we just mentioned, and then filling in with protein sources. And those can come from plant-based, animal-based, um, seafood, lots of different wonderful ways. So that, that is our section on the three foods for a truly nourishing plate. So now at this time, I'm going to move on to, let me just double check that nobody is needing into the system or anything. I'm not missing anything over here in the chat box. Must flex be the front way. Okay, I know they're putting those questions together, so it's hard for me not to answer them on the spot. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our big announcement. Um, there may have been some buzz out there already, but we have some really exciting news. So I know I'm talking about how to develop a really nourishing plate. Well, that goes hand in hand with our big launch at Canodia MD, which is our teaching kitchen called the Nourishing Plate. So we are actually launching our Nourishing Plate, which as mentioned is a teaching kitchen. It's on the second floor of our building. Um, it's all together with Canodia MD. It is our kitchen up there. And that's a place of learning. It's a, a place that we are working to take what you're learning today, take what you're learning about your own health that's been personalized for you if you are a patient of ours or if you're seeking you know, additional assistance in the kitchen. And it's to help you put this into practice. Um, it's to help you take achievable steps to your nutritional health, which starts in the kitchen. So we want to empower people. And that's one of the biggest things I always say. I want to empower you to utilize food as nourishment and healing and find joy and flavor. So it shouldn't feel like a restriction and it shouldn't feel like this experience where we just want to get through it. We want people to have the tools to set themselves up to reach their health goals. And so that's why we've developed this kitchen. So the Nourishing Plate is our newest launch. Um, we are launching it this week. We are starting with private cooking sessions. We are starting out virtually with the eventual, not even hope, we will be eventually having people come in for more of a family experience class. We'll do um, all different types of classes that we're really excited to share the offerings um, based on, on what we hear from you. So my, my favorite part of this is that it's not meant for people to need to be a chef in order to enjoy this experience. You, you get to learn based on what you have with tools in your kitchen and your skill level. So I'm not a chef. I will tell you that right now, but I know how to cook in the kitchen and to create a flavorful, nutritious meal for myself. And that's our goal for you based on whatever dietary needs you have at this time. So uh, Christina is our dietitian in the kitchen. Um, like I said, we are starting off with private sessions. We're running an offer this month for a discount on these one-on-one -on -one sessions. So keep it an eye out for an email from us. Um, you can also email me at nutrition 
at KenodiaMD.com. If you have interest or you are just curious, you want to talk a little bit further about the opportunities. But like I said, this is something that we're really excited about. We hear you. We hear what you need. And, and that's why this has been created for you. So um, if you have questions, please, again, put those in the chat box and, and we will make sure to address those. All right, so let's see here. Next big topic. We are going to discuss immunity. So immunity, let me go back up here to my notes, my cheat sheet. All right, so our immune boosting foods. And I know we're kind of crossed, um, you know, we're overlapping in the sense because it's all intertwined as we keep saying our gut health, our immune system, as we now know, the food we put into our system to support our gut. And now when we talk immunity and COVID, because lots of questions about our immune system and food and how we can use that as a tool, since we're making choices around food every single day. So at this point, we know in order to have a healthy immune system, it's vital for us to support our gut health. And the number one thing I recommend is real whole foods. It's plain and simple, real whole foods. So reducing inflammatory foods, our processed, our refined, our sugar-filled foods, um, you know, in addition to what we've discussed today with our plants and our colorful produce, our fiber, 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 and also our healthy fat, I encourage people to focus on foods that have antiviral properties and, uh, and that are immune boosting. And you may not even know what those are, and you may be eating them already, but we can be more mindful about incorporating these into our week. And the ones, or my favorite ones that I like to share with people are the ones that are, again, easiest for us to include in what we already do. So think seasonings. So when we talk about antiviral properties and immune boosting properties, think about adding ginger into a stir fry or maybe ginger tea, you know, boiling um, some water, putting some ginger in there, some fresh ginger, adding garlic to roasted vegetables. Um, one of my favorites, and this doesn't get a lot of hype either, is roasted rosemary radishes. Now, you may have never actually roasted a radish, but it's, they have that peppery flavor. You add the rosemary on there for the antiviral properties, then add some olive oil afterwards to get the boost of that healthy fat. And you just created a really simple yet fabulous side dish that you can incorporate as, as part of a, 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 your plate or your meal. So rosemary roasted radish is one of my favorite concepts and you're getting a pop of color on there too. So these are some examples of foods that contain antiviral properties, they're immune boosting, and I love this idea because not only are you reaping the benefits, but you're adding flavor. Maybe you don't make use of herbs very often, but this is the time to start because it can do a whole 180 on your typical meal. You know, how many times do I hear people say, oh, I'm so bored, I, I just had a piece of chicken and broccoli. Well, that's going to get boring if we do that five days a week. And to support our gut, gut, we know how important gut diversity is. And that comes from varying the types of foods that we're consuming. Now, again, to simplify, something that we teach all the time is change up the textures. You know, change the textures within your foods. So I will tell you, every week in my grocery cart, we have broccoli. This household is broccoli household. Um, it's just a staple. We use it in so many different ways. But that's why I love it so much is we may make, like last week, we did a, a cold broccoli salad with chickpeas. This week, you know, we may just roast it up and add some olive oil on it. There's so many different opportunities with the same ingredient that it doesn't always have to be bland in the same. Uh, we gave an hour and a half, two hour presentation, you know? The, uh, I hear Dr. Kenodio, I don't know if he knows who he's on. Um, okay, so let's see here. Oh, Laura, roasted radishes are so delicious. <laughs> They're fabulous. The next category within immune health and everything going on right now, I would say is amino acids. And amino acids are the building blocks within protein. So when we think protein, we know that that's essential for our immune function. So protein becomes very important. Now we know that there's all different types of, of protein sources, but one, that, one thing that's especially important with protein is that it's supporting our T cell function. And those are the cells that protect the body against pathogens. 
So getting adequate amounts of quality protein is key. And this is coming from you know, plant-based sources, clean meats, wild caught seafood, eggs, beans, nuts, seeds, lots of fabulous sources of protein. Now, I always get the question, how much? You know, and that, that's going to be different based on the person, but generally the guide is two, four ounce um, or palm size. You can use the palm as, you know, portion size there. Um, two, four ounce portions uh, per day, you know, kind of looking at that as a guide. Um, but like I said, it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. And I don't think people actually look at plant-based sources always as having protein. So we do get some, you know, proteins from our, um, even our, our leafy greens and our cruciferous vegetables. So uh, adequate amino acids and protein, really important for immune health. Um, one right now that I'm looking at is our sunshine, uh, moving on to the next topic, vitamin D. So the best source of vitamin D and, and a lot of hype also, you know, in terms of COVID time and, and immune health. And now I know I'm out here in California, so I'm very grateful and blessed that I have an opportunity to get out in the mornings and go on a walk first thing. Um, you know, but now with the change in weather into the spring and everybody getting out there gardening, getting some sunlight becomes really important. You know, supplementation uh, can also be a great source if needed, um, getting the test to see where your vitamin D levels are at currently and what you may need. Um, and, you know, getting out first thing in the morning for that sunlight is a great time to support your natural circadian rhythm. Whole nother topic, but just throwing that in there on timing of day, you know, really getting your eyes adjusted in the morning with the sunshine. So reaping those benefits as well. Um, and one of my go-to, I know I, I get asked this question a lot. So, you know, when I'm sick or if somebody's sick, um, or if I feel like something's coming on, what is a, a go-to food for me? And I would have to say bone broth soups. That is a staple. If I haven't made one ahead of time and, and frozen it in smaller portions to pull out when I'm really not feeling hot, um, I will actually get a, a brand name, keep it on my shelf or in my freezer for a go-to that I can sip on. Um, I'm not a huge bone broth sipper in the sense I'd rather have it as a soup, but I will tell you the best thing when you are not feeling your best is that you are thanking yourself for preparing ahead of time and having something in the freezer already that you can pull out in a single serve size portion. So my favorite is to make like a, a lemon chicken soup with carrots and celery and that bone broth base and parsley because that's another really great immune boosting food. Um, and it's very hydrating too. So something that's easy to digest, a great source of protein and minerals, um, easy to keep, you know, in your freezer and, and have as needed. Okay, so the next topic, and this is a hot one, this is a hot topic, intermittent fasting. Let's see, okay. Checking everything here, make sure I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Okay, so let's talk intermittent fasting. What is it? <laughs> so you probably heard about it, and intermittent fasting really is, is time-restricted eating. So it's not really about what you eat, it's more about when you eat. Um, there's different forms of intermittent fasting. But essentially to boil it down, it's switching between periods of fasting and eating in a shortened window of time. Um, it, how it works is it, it gives the body an extended rest from digestion and it allows the body to burn through calories from the last meal that you had and then it begins to burn fat. So this actually goes back to prehistoric times, way, way, way long ago when humans were hunter-gatherers and we went time frames um, without eating and that was very natural to happen because you had to forage for your food, um, hunt and forage. And now life's a little bit different. As we know, we have lots of modern conveniences. We have 24 seven access to basically anything we need or want, um, need or want, quote unquote. And this is really just a way of taking us back to our original way of life. So we do see that people do really well with different versions of intermittent fasting. So, there, like I said, there are many different ways. The, one of the most popular ones is the 16-8 method, and that's based on the hours in the day. You've probably heard of it. Um, it's 16 hours without food. Then it's you eat, you eat all of your calories within an eight-hour window. So, for example, a person may eat all of their calories between 11 and 7. So I'll tell you, um, you know, even for myself, 
So I typically will do a 12 hour natural fast. Um, so I aim not to eat two to three hours before bed. And then next day, give myself until at least, let's say I stopped at seven, you know, not eating till seven. Maybe I start with a black coffee or a, a tea, a plain tea. And you're still, if you're not a purist in terms of fasting, because there are different levels of people will say only if you're drinking water versus um, like a black coffee or a plain tea. So it just kind of depends there. We do consider plain beverages to be still fasting. Um, so, you know, today I went 14 hours and that's my sweet spot. So it's different for everybody. I encourage people to go slowly because that's not the right method for everyone. The uh, majority of people will do well with a 12 hour fast. So more of a, I call it a natural fast. So starting by eating two to three hours, um, away from going to bed, <clears throat> that also helps optimize your sleep time allows for cellular repair and turnover, detox, uh, gut rest, all of these wonderful things, and then to be into a fat burning state. There's also the eat stop method. So that's not eating for 24 hours. I, that's not as common that I hear from people. They don't call it that, I will say, um, but many people, not many, some people will say, you know, I, I ate dinner last night and I'm not gonna eat dinner again till tonight. Um, that can be good, you know, to incorporate maybe once or twice a month. That may not be an everyday kind of thing, especially dependent on what your health goals are, your exercise and your activity levels, your schedule. And then we have the 5-2 method. And this isn't based on hours, this is based on the days of the week. So five days of eating what you would normally, your normal intake, and then two days a week where um, it's more calorie restricted and it tends to be around 500, 600 calories is what that's restricted to. We actually um, have used the 5-2 method, but we do it in the sense of a bone broth fast on those two days. They're non-consecutive days, and we see people do really well with that for weight loss benefits. Again, not for everybody, but we like the bone broth concept because um, you're still getting protein and nutrients and, and minerals. Um, you feel actually satisfied. I hear people say, I feel, I feel so full and satisfied and nourished. Um, but the goal is still to give the body gut rest and to just kind of fluctuate those patterns throughout the week. Um, so kind of going back to, you know, again, what is, what's the right way to do this? It depends on what's going on in, in your body. And I, I know people don't like that answer, you know, that it depends on the person, but it really does. So I know my sweet spot is around 14 hours. I may do 16 hours once or twice a month, maybe not even intentionally. Um, it may just happen because of my schedule. So we want to work up to the level that's right for you. So factors that need to be taken into account, though, is that people need to take caution if they have, um, uh, if they are pregnant, if they're underweight, if they have diabetes, their adrenal health. So there are factors that need to be taken into account. So it's not, hey, let's get started and, and start fasting. Um, so the other thing I do want to mention is that another, I don't even want to call it a form of fasting, but it's just optimizing your day of eating patterns. So aiming for three to four hours between meals. Again, not for everybody. We understand some people need to eat more frequently, but it does give the gut a rest period. Um, it allows it to digest that food, move on to the, the next meal in three to four hours. So just giving rest breaks. So my question to people is always pause. Are you hungry for that snack? Is there another reason that you're grabbing for that snack? Are you bored? Is it an emotional trigger? So there's so much more that goes behind this concept um, and, and with fasting just in general. So let me make sure I didn't miss anything there. Um, and getting started, I, I know I touched on this for what I do for myself, but you know, start by skipping the late dinners. You know, if anything, optimizing your, your sleep hygiene by cutting off food two to three hours before bedtime. Um, that way your, your body is not actively digesting. And then you can enhance your fast with a good night's sleep. So that's a whole nother topic that I know Dr. Kenodia will probably want to get his hands on is talking about sleep and sleep hygiene. Um, but when, when you sleep, you're also not eating. So it's easier to do your fast as well. And then, you know, like I said, increasing um, your hours in the morning from if you typically eat at seven, wait until eight. You give your body an hour after waking. That may lead to two hours, three hours, and that may be adjusted from there. And the last thing I'm fasting before I get to the questions, I know I'm getting some uh, being sent this way, are the, on the long-term benefits of fasting. <clears throat> so what they're finding in research is that um, people are experiencing a sharper mind and mental clarity, um, boost in memory, uh, improved blood pressure, 
fat loss, and then helping with regulation of insulin levels. So lots of uh, benefits that they're finding with fasting. It's just about finding that right one for you. And my last note on fasting is be flexible. It doesn't have to be the same every single day. Mix it up. Our body's really smart. It, it adapts really well, but you will actually do better with, you know, mixing it up. Maybe today it's it's 16 hours of fasting. Tomorrow it's your regular eating pattern. Maybe this month you do one of the 24 hour fast. So it doesn't have to be the same thing every day and work with a practitioner, you know, come work with us. <laughs> we'll help you through that. Um, but that's a wrap on fasting. Let me take a look here at the questions that I have received from the team. Let's see here. All right. Okay, so let's see. Um, raw versus cooked. Does cooking our vegetables detract from the nutrients we're getting? Great question. And there's a couple of different ways we can take this. I always tell people mixing it up is key. So it's not that we need to eat everything raw or we need to eat everything cooked. Um, I will say with cooking though, we don't want to burn, we don't want to blacken, we want to steam, you know, we want to keep those nutrients, um, just like when you, when you look at the food, we want to keep them bright and vibrant and, you know, optimized within the body, but a good mix is really key and we actually enhance some when we enhance some of our, um, vitamins when we steam them. So think about like our, our fat soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K. So um, we can optimize the absorption of those by adding healthy fats on them. And when we're cooking them, um, and I know I use the steaming example, but if you add olive oil on that afterwards, you're enhancing those nutrients. So it's, it's an interesting concept. Some nutrients will increase, some will decrease depending on what you're doing with them. And that's why the variety is so key. So you're getting a blend of all of those benefits, if that makes sense. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me grab a glass of water. And then our next question is, must flaxseed be ground or can it be used whole? Great question. So I encourage people to buy whole flax seeds and buy them in smaller containers too, you know, just again, to keep it as fresh as possible. Our body has a hard time breaking that down and, and actually getting those benefits from those oils in the flax seed. So the, one of the best practices is that we can actually buy them whole. So I get Bob's Red Mill, smaller bag of it. I keep it in my fridge. I will grind up just enough for a few days. I believe they are saying now up to a week that you can, but again, as fresh as possible, but we want it to be convenient as well, so you'll actually consume them. And then um, when we grind them, the oils are actually extracted and we can get a lot of the, more of those benefits from the flax. So great question. It's better if we can actually grind those up and uh, storing it in the fridge. Um, that'll also help with the freshness. How to do the right thing when you eat out versus home? Great question. Good talk a whole nother half an hour on this, but I won't. <laughs> so how to do the right thing when you eat out? Well, first off, I'm going to put that in quotes. What's right? You know, what, is, what does that mean? What is eating the right way? So we have to, you know, also look at food again, going back to food as nourishment food is healing. We do our best. It's not about perfection. It's about, you know, taking some of that stress away, but with that in mind, being prepared. So when I talk to people about going out to eat, you know, one of the first questions also is how often are you going out to eat? So how often are we being faced with these choices and how do you feel afterwards? So if you don't feel well every single time you go out to eat, that may be giving us some clues as to what your body may be reacting to, that there's some um, factors, that, because we can't control everything, right? When we go out to eat, we can control as much as possible when we're at home in our own kitchen. But to be social and we know things are going to come up, we want to stay prepared. So when you go out to eat, I always encourage people, take a look at the menu ahead of time, number one. Um, if I'm in a new area, I yelp the area. So we're currently out in California traveling around for, um, my fiance is a travel nurse. And so we're in new areas. Um, and so I like to yelp around and say, you know, for me, I eat gluten-free. So let's find, let's find what's going to be good around this area. So kind of narrowing down places um, that maybe are plant-based or whatever it is that aligns with how you're eating. And then when you're actually there, look for what the protein source is on the menu. Maybe that's a piece of fish. Maybe you see fried chicken on there. So you could ask, you know, can I get a, a baked piece of chicken versus the fried version? Maybe you see salad options and you can tailor what you want on it based on the other ingredients. So I always say, look at how you can order a la carte. 
Look for your fiber, your plants, your vegetables. Ask them to steam them or boil. You know, that's one, but people, I mean, it doesn't have as much flavor. Um, so asking uh, those questions ahead of time, you can call in, focus on a protein, a fat, and a, and a fiber. Um, you know, a great example, I get questions all the time on, well, I want to go to a Mexican restaurant. What, what should I eat there? Well, you know, I, I tend to encourage people to look for uh, fajitas, you know, because there's uh, vegetables, you can do vegetarian, you can do um, with chicken, you can do all different versions that comes with vegetables, you can do lettuce, guacamole, and there's options. And it, it's, I don't want to call it cleaner, because again, what is right for you is not necessarily what's right for me, but we still are getting our template. And that's what's important. So um, I'll leave it at that. If you have more questions, you know, we can always chat further. But I think there's a lot of ways that we can prepare and that we can control as much as possible, but enjoy the experience because you're with, you may be with people and you just really want to be present and you want to enjoy it and, it and you don't want it to feel like a stressor. And that's something we develop that healthy relationship when we work together too, is just figuring out what that experience means for you and what it can look like for you. Um, any cool tips on storing and preserving fresh veggies and fruit? <clears throat> oh, I'm all about the kitchen hacks. <laughs> um, let's see. So preserving veggies. So some of my favorite things to do, um, for example, with leafy greens is to put the paper towel in there and flip the container over and that'll help it stay fresh longer because the moisture goes to the paper towel. Um, I also like the hack of with my herbs or my green onions, putting them in a jar with water um, and then they continue to grow versus you put them in there for a couple days and they will and you toss them. So putting them, you know, in a glass of water, it's it's amazing. I feel like I have my little at home garden, even though, you know, with your current situation, it may just be that glass on your sink or in your fridge. Um, those are some fun things. Um, I always encourage when you when you get home, you know, from the store, chop up chop up your veggies. So with carrots, you know, putting them in in water. Um, or I'm sorry, sorry. I always have to think about this. We put our celery and carrots, we chop them up and we put them in a, a shallow bowl and it has some water in there in the fridge. They're ready to eat and they'll last longer that way too. Um, what else? Uh, avocados, you know, putting the skin back over it. And then that way you like, I'll, I'll leave the, the pit in there, um, put it back over, leave it in the fridge that'll help it last longer. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any specific fruits or vegetables, let me know and I can think of off the top of my head, but heartier vegetables, you know, that's nice too to kind of plan for um, later in the week um, to make use of them. And so like heartier, what I mean by that is like your, uh, like broccoli will last longer. I know that because we eat a lot of broccoli. It'll last longer in the week or you can roast them ahead of time and then kind of keep them throughout the week. And, and you'll get, you know, a chance to really see that if you roast up some asparagus versus if you roast up some broccoli, how long does it last for you kind of thing. And you can kind of see how asparagus isn't going to last as long throughout the week, whereas broccoli would. So those are just a, a couple of things there. Um, <clears throat> let's see, a couple more questions. What is your thought on the occasional one day juice cleanse? I think, you know, with the occasional juice cleanse, my question would be, you know, what's the purpose for you? What are you trying to achieve? Um, you know, I think with juice like cleanse per se, we, we actually offer um, some juice cleanses for like three to five days, but you're under supervision of Dr. Kenodia and myself, um, and it's for certain reasons. So our really it goes back to, are we trying to optimize our liver detoxification? You know, what is it that we're trying to support? And are there certain foods that we can geared towards whatever we're trying to achieve with that. And then how do you feel on a juice cleanse? Because we have to remember with juices, we're stripping out that fiber, um, which can uh, help us with our blood sugar regulation. Um, and so, you know, I, I'll have an occasional green juice here and there, but it's not something that I'm, you know, uh, telling people, hey, have a juice cleanse day, unless we see that it, it could be medically um, helpful. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's more questions to that. Uh, you know, if you enjoy having the, the green juices or beet juices or whatever that looks like, I think that it could be incorporated, but I think it goes to a bigger picture question of, of what's, what, what are you trying to achieve? 
can I substitute bone broth with regular chicken broth? So they are a little bit different. So the beauty of bone broth is the time that it's been simmered. So that's what it helps provide us with all of those benefits. So for example, um, I'll use this brand because we have it in office, but Brockmasters, the reason we chose that is for the amount of time that they simmer the bones. So I believe it's over 48 hours. I can't remember if it's 48 or 72. Anything over 24 is fabulous. Um, so the longer that the bones are simmered, the more nourishment you're being that is being pulled, the minerals, and the more benefit for you. Um, so to answer your question, I think what you're asking is between like a bone broth and maybe like a stock or a broth, those aren't going to be the same. And I would be curious, what I would say is let's get curious, you know, how long have the bones been simmered? Are they good quality bones as well? So are they grass fed? You know, what we just have to investigate a little bit further. But yes, there is chicken bone broth, if that was your question as well. Um, okay. Sorry about the box. Oh my God. Can bee pollen sub for flax and or and or rose? I think it's supposed to say rose hips. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, can bee pollen sub for flax? Good question. You know what? I would have to look more into that. I don't know off the top of my head. I think again, too, my further question for you, and I'm not sure who asked this, but for bee pollen, what, what the goal is that you're trying to receive and if it's a different benefit than what you're receiving from flax. So um, great question. You know, I would love to investigate that a little bit further to give you a, a good answer. Um, do you have a good resource for finding and ensuring uh, that the inputs and ingredients are the highest quality possible? Wait, do you have a good resource for finding and ensuring that the inputs, that the ingredients are the highest quality possible? that removes the marketing. So I think if I'm understanding correctly, I, I, I'm not sure that I'm understanding the question 100%. Um, so if you're wondering like with the terms maybe that are on the packaging, like organic versus non-GMO versus free range pasture raised, if that's the direction that you're asking, I do have some resources for that that we can provide because it can like labeling can be so incredibly confusing. Um, and now we see what uh, good for heart health and it just, well, you know, what, what are they trying, what are these health claims essentially? Um, so if that's what you're asking, yes, I do have some resources to differentiate between the meanings on packages and understanding the quality of uh, like meats or eggs or fish or, or whatever that looks like. But if you can write in the chat box again, clarify if that's incorrect and I can, I can pull that from the marketing team as well. Um, tips for teenager buy-in. That's a tough one. That is a, a very tough one. I think <clears throat> One of the biggest things when I'm working with a teenager and you know, and, and just kids in general, well, number one, we need support from the top. So we always want a parent or somebody else doing this with them. So in terms of making nutritional adjustments or you know, really trying to optimize their, their nutrient intake or whatever that need is, um, we want them to feel supported. I think the biggest thing is that we want to keep a healthy relationship as well with food. So we want to keep a mindfulness and awareness. And one of the easiest ways to uh, start to make adjustments is finding substitutions. Um, so I, I think the buy-in question piece, what's hard with that, and I've had a lot of questions or a lot of conversations with our other practitioners is, you know, we can't force anybody to want to make change. We can provide resources, but they have to do it when they're ready as well. Um, so I think that's, that's a tough one. And I think that it comes from the support, what they're seeing modeled around them, getting them involved in the kitchen. And it depends on what age you're talking about too here, but, you know, getting them involved in the kitchen, providing resources, modeling it yourself, um, making, or, uh, providing substitutions. Those are all great ways to go about it. And if there's a lot of pushback, you know, there's, there's things that we can start slowly and it may be a frustrating process, but we also know that with anything, with functional medicine, 
It's a process for healing. You know, what, what is the long-term goal and it's for healing. So we don't want to force something on somebody who may not be ready and then them in turn have a negative relationship and just continue pushback, if that makes sense. So I think there's a, um, more to ask and really figure out the, the, why, where is that pushback coming from? You know, are, are they fearful? Are they, um, feeling, I always hear from people, it's not normal, you know, because my friends or this or that. So we have to get to the root of, you know, why, why are they pushing back? There's a reason. There's always a reason. Um, and I think that's the end of our questions here. I will just wait a couple more minutes to see if I get anything over from the team. Thanks for hanging in there, guys. This has been really fun. I know it wasn't as we had planned, um, but yeah, this was a, a great webinar. I hope you really enjoyed it. I look forward to chatting with anybody who wants to chat further. You know, reach out to me at my email, nutrition at canodiamd.com, um, or I, I believe the team's going to be sending out an email uh, to wrap things up and provide any resources that have been asked for. So thank you again, and I look forward to doing this in the future. Thank you.